So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for being. So in the first one, we've seen uh, uh, supervised learning, which, uh, as I was mentioning, is conceptually very similar to, to fitting, so the easiest one. In the second one, we have seen unsupervised learning, and uh, I was mentioning those examples, and yesterday the, the goal there was that I had, so in this case, I had a lot of samples and I also had labels. Okay, so the labels, I remind you, are those, the, the value that the ideal function, high dimensional function, takes on those values. In this case of the unsupervised, I only had samples and not labels, and the goal was to find the probability distribution in according to which those samples are distributed. In the third case, which is like where really artificial intelligence goes wild, is where you don't have samples, you don't have labels, you have nothing. You just have a goal you want to solve. So this is called typically reinforcement learning. So in this case, you don't have some, but at least you have to have something, and this something is the goal you want to solve, right? So for example, I want to solve quantum mechanics. More precisely, I want to solve Schrodinger's equation. So I will find you, I will show you a representation of quantum mechanics, if you want, which is amenable for machine learning purposes. So this is the goal of this lecture, and I will show you also some codes that do that. But in general, this paradigm of reinforcement learning, as all the others, has some practical applications, or at least some real-world applications which are not in the context of physics. So since it's a Saturday morning, I would like to entertain you a little bit. So this, uh, the, an application that you can, uh, for example, think of this reinforcement learning is to play games. So in this case, you don't have, for example, data. You just have the rules of the game. So you know that a certain game has a, has a score, and uh, you have to, to, to obey some rules in order to get the best score possible. So this is the case, for example, of this uh, rather famous game, at least for people born in the 80s, like me, not you. And in this case, you have this game where you have to, you know, you have this ball and this slider and you have to make the most possible points. So uh, the Google team, which is uh, Deep Brain, which is in London, basically devised a machine which is based on this paradigm of reinforcement learning, which just sees the pixels of the picture that we have in the top. So just all the, the raw pixels and the final score and the goal of this machine, then, is to maximize the score of this, uh, of this game. So uh, you can do this uh, in a, with a training, a self-consistent training. I'm going to discuss it in later. But I mean, the nice thing is that uh, if, the, if the training does not last very, very long, so for example, oh, sorry, for example, in this case, so in the first case, on the left, you see that the training is very bad. So you see, the guy is not really winning. On the other side, where we have a much longer train, so the machine really gets good and find also a trick, right? So this tunneling trick that you can, uh, that people, you see that? So uh, in this case, the machine is really able to, to understand what are the, the, what is the best strategy possible to, to win this game. And uh, again, th this paradigm is much more complex than the other two we have shown here simply because we do not know in advance, for example, 
uh, what, uh, what, is the, what are the winning points, or let's say, what are the, the positions I should move the, the cursor to win the game. I just know the score. Uh, for example, if I want to drive a car, I just know uh, the position of the car. I don't know the optimal trajectory from, to go to, from A to B. It can change dynamically. So that's the, the, the goal of this branch of machine learning. Now, let's see how I can uh, do quantum mechanics with that. So first of all, um, what is the problem? The problem is that I would like to, uh, to, to solve Schrodinger's equation, right? Let's say for the ground state, okay? So Schrodinger's equation is uh, an eigenvalue equation where I want to determine the eigenvalues i. So this is certainly not a, a, a problem which is amenable as it is to, uh, to machine learning purposes. Uh, because it's an eigenvalue problem. However, uh, I can try to transform it into a machine learning problem uh, if I, I manage to, to transform it into an optimization problem, right? So what is the, uh, the, the, the thing that I have to use? Well, it's very simple. So for example, we know uh, that from the variational theorem that uh, if I define an object that I call E of, uh, of psi, if you want, so technically speaking, this is a, a functional of the state, and uh, I define the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over the state, right? So I know that this object is uh, greater or equal than the ground state energy. For example, here I'm assuming that I've ordered my eigenstates in this way, right? Sorry. So from the variational theorem, I know that, right? So uh, at least finding in the ground state, but this can be generalized also to other properties, can be found then as an optimization problem. So uh, again, which might be more amenable to machine learning. And this optimization problem is finding, so the minimum over all possible states psi of this energy functional E of psi. Okay, so in principle, the task that I have to do to, to solve uh, this complicated uh, equation is just to, uh, is just, I mean, it's just to, uh, to loop, to, to look, to do a search in the space of all possible uh, normalizable quantum states, psi, and, uh, and uh, at the end, eventually, I will find the one that has the minimum energy. So this is, if you want, uh, the, the, the simplest thing uh, we can do. And uh, th this idea of, uh, of course, of, uh, uh, of doing the variational, uh, or using the variational principle to solve a complicated many body Hamiltonian, for example, is not new, I mean. Uh, however, uh, what, what has been remarked uh, in, the, in the 60s, so more, more or less at the same time when uh, machine learning was invented, in a sense, is that uh, the expectation value over a certain state uh, is the, the quantity which is typically hard to compute if you have uh, a, a many-body correlated state. Okay, so unless psi is, for example, a simple product state, it is very hard to compute this quantity exactly, unless you have some uh, uh, un nice analytical properties in psi, so unless you restrict yourself to very specific choices. Uh, but in general, this E of psi is rather uh, hard to compute. So, um, so, but people in the six years realize that this can be done in a stochastic way. So what is the idea? So let's assume, for example, that my, uh, my system is spanned by a, sec by a set of cats, uh, many body cats, X. So you can imagine of the, uh, that these are, for example, the, in a simple case, uh, the projection of the spin for a, for a spin one-half quantum system. So I have N spins, right? So the quantum numbers for this model are just, uh, for this system, are just N plus or minus one. So these are the, the, this is a full set of states in the Hilbert space, so that we can write this expectation value of the energy over a generic state as basically, so I insert a completeness, so this can be written as the sum of all possible axes of uh, psi, uh, x, x, h, x prime, so here I will have a sum over x and x prime, and then here I will have x prime, psi, 
Psi, and then I have the normalization. Now, if we, uh, if we do some simple manipulation, for example, we divide everything by uh, psi, uh, psi of x prime in this case, okay? So we can rewrite this object at the end as the sum over x of, um, so let me, let me call it like this, psi of x modulus square times, so the sum over x prime, h x, x prime psi of x prime divided psi of x. And then at the, the, at the denominator, I have the same quantity, but without this. So what is psi of x? Well, psi of x, by definition, is this. So it's just the amplitude of my, my wave function. So this is very general, it's valid for any wave function, basically. Um, but the advantage of doing so is that you can see immediately that then the expectation value of the energy of the Hamiltonian can be written as a statistical expectation value, right? So it can be written, so you can consider this as your unnormalized prob uh, probability density. So psi squared is your unnormalized probability density. And this as the quantity that you are estimating on this unnormalized probability density. So this object takes the name in the community of uh, variational Monte Carlo uh, methods of the local energy, it's called E log of x. Actually, there is nothing local in the, in the sense of quantum information because this Hamiltonian can be no, highly non-local, but it's called local energy for some reason. So, and uh, uh, this thing, so you can just write it as the expectation value over of the local energy over this probability distribution, okay? Now, uh, this is very important then because if I have a generic state which is correlated, which is not mean field, which is whatever, I can just uh, do basically a Monte Carlo sampling, so what I discussed yesterday in the context of, uh, for example, uh, unsupervised learning, and I, I can estimate this expectation value as, uh, uh, for example, so I, what I do is that I generate a lot of samples, so x1, x2, x, and s, which are distributed according to a probability distribution, which is psi of x squared. So imagine that I fix my, 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 my state now, and I can draw a lot of samples, for example, doing metropolis, to generate those, uh, those configurations those many body states. And here, I can then estimate this ex quantum expectation value as one over the number of samples, so again, as the simple average of the local energy over those xi, okay? So this is the, the fundamental connection uh, that has been done uh, in the 60s, for example, by, by Macmillan, one of the pioneers of this field, who understood that quantum expectation values can be computed exactly as classical expectation values over the probability distribution, and then you can sample this probability distribution using Monte Carlo. Now, um, the interesting aspect is that we can not only compute exactly the, the, the local energy, so the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, but also, uh, in, okay, we can also compute any other operator, basically, not just substitute uh, H with your favorite operator. So that's uh, the first thing. And the other thing is that we can also compute uh, efficiently the derivatives of, the, of, the, of this uh, energy. For example, imagine that I want to optimize this, uh, this thing. And uh, imagine that my state now, psi of x, depends on a set of parameters, P1, P, and P, where this and P can be huge, millions, hundred thousand. Okay, so, uh, so in this context, uh, then I can also, uh, I, so I've shown you that the expectation value over this state of, uh, so, the expectation value of H can be written as the statistical expectation value of the local energy. 
But it is also true that the gradient of this, uh, of this expectation value, for example, with respect to some parameter P of K, so I call this E of uh, Psi, right? This can be written also as an expectation value over this probability distribution Pi of X. So in particular, you can show, and uh, uh, I mean, it's uh, quite straightforward calculations, that this is equal to, uh, to the expectation value of uh, um, basically uh, the local energy times what I call uh, D of K, and that uh, I already introduced yesterday, but now in a moment I will remind you what it is, uh, minus, so the expectation value of the local energy alone times the expectation value of this uh, D of K star. So star is the complex conjugate. So all of those expectation values are taken again over this probability distribution pi, so psi square, basically. And the, this D of K, uh, it's what I introduced also yesterday in the context of unsupervised learning. So D of K of X is defined as the, basically the, the, the derivative with respect to parameter P, K of the log of my psi of X. Okay, so imagine that I have some uh, form for my variation of my function from my state, which depends on some parameters. And then I can do the derivative with respect to those parameters, the derivative of the log of psi so that I know immediately what this D of K are. Uh, the local energy can also be efficiently computed, typically, so I will not go into the, this de de detail. Uh, and uh, you can measure then, uh, so if you do this procedure so that you can uh, sa you sample a lot of configurations distributing according to pi, you can estimate both the, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and the gradient, right? So this is, then the fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental things that, uh, that we needed to transform quantum mechanics uh, into machine learning. So the, fir the first one is basically to convert uh, an eigenvalue problem into an optimization problem that I can uh, somehow <laughs> work with. So this is the optimization problem I get and this is how I would solve it if I have a generic state. Now, uh, the connection that somehow has been missing uh, since uh, the, the birth of this field, is how to uh, identify psi. What, what, what psi should I take, which, uh, which is general enough to uh, somehow hope converging to, to the exact ground state. So this is what we've done in our recent work, so published uh, last February. And the idea is to, to take as a psi a neural network, so an artificial neural network. So by, from the way that I've already written here, you can immediately realize where I was going to, since uh, the goal of my neural network now is not to translate uh, a string of text, is not to solve a game, is not to do anything, but it's to compute the amplitudes of the wave function. So let me, let me write this. So what I want, what I want to do is that I want to identify this psi of x, so the amplitudes again, so this psi of x is this object, right, with a, an artificial neural network, so an F neural network, which will depend on this high dimensional vector x, which can be, for example, the projection of your spin and which will depend on some parameters. So I've shown you, for example, the case of the feedforward network where those parameters are the connections, are the weights in your network. Uh, I've shown you uh, the case of uh, the, 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 the restricted Boltzmann machine where the weights of the connection between the, the hidden and the visible units were the, the parameters, so I remind you so for example, in the case of the, of the RBM, 
the specific form that we took for this F RBM was inspired by classical, uh, basically statistical physics. So in that case, so I, I told you that so this F RBM, which depends on the spins, right? So sigma one, sigma two, sigma n, was the sum over all the possible values of the of the hidden unit of an interaction between my physical spin and those hidden units, which takes the form. So in this case, that I have sigma z as an input, if you want, of this machine, sigma z i h j, if you want, also this is a z, so it's again a plus or minus one variable, w i j plus then I had the sum over j of h j b j, and then I had the sum over i a i sigma z i. So in this formulation, then my parameters, so my p's are the, the weights, are the, the biases, b and a, so the bias of the hidden units and the visible ones. Okay, so this is basically what you need to do to do machine learning for quantum mechanics. You need to know, you need to identify the wave function amplitudes with a suitable neural network. So a, a choice which is uh, rather reasonable is to, um, which actually uh, achieves some uh, state of the art results in uh, 1D and 2D actually, is to use uh, on some uh, models, is to, to use this, uh, this form, this specific form that I just wrote you here. So here in this RBM form, you, you fix the number of hidden units, so this number of artificial, so these are your, I remind you, so these are your physical spins, and these are the, the artificial uh, hidden uh, neurons, which somehow mediate the, the correlations and the interactions, if you want, between uh, the physical spins. So what I can do is that I just tune those, those things in order to best reproduce my ground state. So that's the idea. And to do that, I need two ingredients. So the first one is the, the ability to sample from this machine, right? So I want to generate a lot of configurations, a lot of x1, uh, x2, x3, which are generated according to psi of x squared. And the other one is that I need to you do some uh, stochastic gradient descent or some uh, uh, approximation, some uh, optimization algorithm in order to minimize the energy function as a function of those parameters. And this can be done using, again, the, those, those samples and using the, the, the gradient that I can explicitly compute as an expectation value over those, uh, those configurations. Now, the sampling from the RBM is what we've discussed yesterday. Uh, there is a sub dot t, of course, in this case, and um, so in general, uh, the wave function is complex valued, right? So yesterday we discussed only the case uh, where those parameters are real, real valued. Of course, this, that case is not general enough if you want to, to describe uh, um, a wave function in the sense that uh, if you want to do this, uh, uh, you want to identify psi with f, you need this function in general to be complex valued. So in the, in the general case, you might want to take these Ws and uh, Bs and As complex valued. So if you do that, typically you cannot choose any longer the Gibbs sampling strategy that I was introducing, but you just need to, to do standard uh, uh, metropolis sampling. And uh, uh, and uh, generate your configurations and measure your local energy. It's all uh, rather straightforward. So um, an, an interesting property that I would like to discuss um, now is how this optimization, before showing you some actual numerical results live, is how this uh, uh, optimization uh, can take advantage of some specific properties of quantum mechanics.
So in particular, uh, you might uh, remember that yesterday I discussed the connection between the stochastic gradient descent and this Langevin equation, right? So I show you that there is a connection between the effective temperature of your classical system and the noise that you have on the gradient. So also in this case you have a noise, because, simply because those expectation values are estimated over finite samples, a finite amount of samples. So on those, on those gradients you also have a noise which uh, with the sigma square, we, we, we go like, uh, so the noise on this, so the variance of this variable, if you want, the variance of the, the expectation value of the gradient. So I call it of G of K, let me call it G of K, the gradient. Uh, so this thing will go like one over the number of samples that I have drawn from my probability distribution. So in principle, there is always some no intrinsic noise, which is good, as I was telling you yesterday, because it allows us to, to, um, to converge to the, to, the, to the global minimum of the distribution, in this case of the, of the energy of the system, the actual physical energy. Uh, however, uh, we also might want to, to control this noise, or at least be sure that the temperature we, we arrive at the end to is, uh, is zero. And uh, there is a nice property, uh, and the property uh, which is uh, easier to show, for example, in the case of the local energy, is that, for example, the variance of the, of the local energy as a variable. So you consider your local energy, so the expectation value of the local energy is uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So what is the variance then of the local energy? So if you want the expectation value of the local energy square minus the local energy square, okay? So this is, these are just the statistical fluctuations of the local energy, and also those are, have a very nice uh, uh, physical meaning, because you can show, I, I will not go through the derivation, that this is equal to the expectation value of the variance of the physical Hamiltonian. Okay? So you can demonstrate that using a couple of tricks. Now, this is rather nice because it tells you that, for example, the fluctuations that you have on the local energy tend to reduce when the Hamiltonian converges to the exact ground state. So can you see that? Uh, because if if your state is, uh, is, uh, is an exact eigenstate, for example, then H psi, right, is, I mean, H psi, uh, so H square psi, if you want, so this quantity which is here, is simply equal to, normalized, is simply equal to E squared, because psi is an eigenstate of H. And here, we have the same quantity, which is E squared, so the variance of the Hamiltonian is zero if we are on a, a close, or we are at an exact time set of the Hamiltonian. So the magic thing which happens is that it, uh, the closer you get to the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, the smaller the fluctuations on the gradient, for example, and also on the energy will become. So this means that uh, uh, the closer you approach the exact solution, uh, the less noise you will have. So this is something which is peculiar, I would say, or particular of the quantum mechanics that you do not find in, st in standard uh, um, applications in, uh, in machine learning, typically. Uh, so in particular, this means also that typically, so uh, the, this uh, learning rate that I introduced yesterday, so which is the rate at which you change your parameters, can typically be taken just fixed. So you do not want to annihilate it as a function of the number of, uh, of the iterations, simply because the, the temperature decreases by itself Inter because the variance of your gradient goes down automatically. Now, I can show you this uh, uh, at work for a simple example, numerically. Uh, so the simple example I'm going to treat is the case in which the Hamiltonian is, uh, is the, the harmonic oscillator. So here I'm taking h bar equal one, omega one, uh, whatever, equal to one, m equal one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I take as, a, as an answer, so as a simple answer for the ground state, just to show this property, uh, psi of x 
uh, the exponential basically of uh, some, uh, some Gaussian, which I call uh, uh, so I, minus alpha x squared. Okay? So I take, if you want, there's a variational parameter in this case, this parameter alpha, which I can, so that I can play with and I can modify in order to convert to the ground state. This is just to show you how, what happens to the energy as a function of the. Ah, yeah, so, uh, so those things are, uh, will be, I mean, some of them are already on my GitLab uh, repository. Those codes that I'm going to discuss. Um, so the first, so they are there. In, this, thing, this is publicly accessible, so you can go there and download those codes and play with them. Um, there are also some other lecture notes from another school, but I mean, there's a lot of material you might want to, to, to have a look at. So in this case, uh, let me show you the example of the, of the, um, so of the, of the icing model. Sorry, I have to find the right. Okay. Uh, Okay, so here, again, I'm optimizing alpha, so this parameter in the wave function, and what I'm doing is that I'm generating samples of uh, drawn according to psi square using some metropolis. So you can have a look at the code again in, in the repository. I don't know why the sound is not dead, but it should be. Uh, and then, so you can call this script, which is called, <laughs> okay, which is called, okay. Uh, so you see that uh, uh, I am, uh, so you can probably not see it, but so I start from a very, uh, so. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the code. So optimize harmonic. So here, what I do is that I start with a state, psi. Ah, this is in Python, I hope you are fluent in Python. So this state, so I start with a Python, with a state uh, which has alpha equal to uh, one. So it's not the exact eigenstate. You know that alpha, one alpha is the exact eigenstate in this case. Uh, and then I, what I do is that I generate uh, some, uh, some samples and then I consider the, I compute here, for example, the, the local energy and I compute the derivative of the local energy, so this gradient. And I use this information just to, to, to change the parameters. So uh, what, you can, uh, what you can plot then is, the, for example, the expectation value of the, of the, of the energy as a function of the, of the time. And here I'm using a number of samples, which is very small, I think 100. So this is the energy as a function of the iteration count. So you can see the plot here. I generated it in real time. And uh, uh, it is very noisy because uh, I start with a very bad uh, answers for the, for the wave function. So again, I had half equal one, which is very large. Uh, and so at the beginning, the energy is much, uh, is very large, and it is very far from the exact, uh, uh, ex from the exact energy, which, is, which in this case is uh, one half. And you see also that I have wild, wild fluctuations in this quantity, simply because at the beginning, uh, I'm taking not enough samples to have a good resolution, and I have a very huge variance. But I'm keeping eta uh, fixed, and then I'm, uh, I'm doing this optimization in the way basically I described here. And you can see that at the end, the energy approaches 0.5, like with a precision uh, which is unbelievably accurate. <laughs> so you can have a look at the, the, uh, the thing, and you can see that the, the energy is 0.5000311. So you see? So for example, this is the last uh, uh, iteration. And you can see that the variance, for example, this energy is 10 to the minus 8, or something extremely small, basically uh, at the level of uh, numerical precision. So you can see that because of this property of the, of, the, of the Hamiltonian, because of this property of quantum mechanics, even if you are doing something stochastic, so which is intrinsically dirty in a sense because we have noise, we can convert to very high precision in the, the energy and also in other properties. Now, of course, this is interesting, but uh, again, it's a toy model. It's just uh, the, the harmonic oscillator. We want to do something more complicated. So to do something more complicated, we need the, the good stuff. So we need the RBM. And this is the other example that uh, I'm going to put on this repository, or you can already find it. 
so in this case, I consider a Hamiltonian, which is already a prototype for strongly interacting models. Uh, so I consider the, the transverse field as in model. So in this case, I have a one-dimensional chain with periodic boundaries, and I have my sigma x operator proportional to my uh, transverse field gamma. And then I have some, uh, uh, in this case, uh, nearest neighboring uh, interaction of the form uh, sigma i z sigma i plus one of z, right? So again, here I have uh, a lattice of spins of, uh, so I have uh, sigma one, z, sigma two, up to sigma n. And I have periodic boundaries, so I have interactions uh, in this way. And I also have a transfer field on each of those. Uh, if you want, I have a transfer field on each of those points. So this model uh, uh, has a nice property which allows to simplify a little bit the presentation of this code, uh, which is that uh, uh, the ground state is, uh, is positive definite. So you can demonstrate that in 1D. So in this case, then uh, what I will do is something uh, a little bit different because I just want to simplify uh, the, the code. And I will say that psi square, so psi square now is, uh, is uh, my uh, probability distribution. If you want, so psi square of x, so of sigma one, sigma n, z. So I identify psi square with uh, my uh, f rbm, if you want, with my distribution. Okay, so you see the difference uh, here is that before I was doing psi equal f, here I'm doing psi square, and this, this is fine, because, but the, the simplification is that now I can, uh, you take uh, just the real param parameters for those interactions, for example, for these w's, because psi square is positive by, by definition. And also I can use Gibbs sampling to, 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 to draw samples to, from this psi square. So I can generate those uh, Configuration just using the Gibbs sampling approach that I discussed yesterday. Again, uh, those are details that uh, are discussed somehow also in my lecture notes. Um, so what we can do is that we can go um, we can go here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's okay. So, okay, so this code is pretty general. You can use it uh, for any Hamiltonian and basically any, any graph. So here I'm just considering the case, in, the case of 20 spins, right? Uh, and, uh, okay, hypercube uh, one dimension is just uh, a lattice. So, so, in, so, so, okay, so the first thing defines the number of spins. The second thing defines the, the geometry, the, the graph, if you want, on which your model is defined, which in this case is in a hypercube of dimension one, so it's a line and I have periodic boundaries. Uh, and then this defines the Hamiltonian. So you can, uh, so the Hamiltonian depends, it's, 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 as it, um, as it, I'm assuming that all of you know C++, but probably it's not a good assumption, so, but anyway. Uh, and uh, this, this Hamiltonian takes as a template the graph, so the, 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 the thing on which this Hamiltonian lives, so in this case a one-dimensional lattice. Uh, and then you have, uh, you, can, you have to specify the number of hidden variables. So again, it's this number here. So how many of those I want to put in my neural network. So the more I put, the, the clever my neural network will be, and the longer it will take to optimize, of course, but that's the, the trade-off. And then here I basically define my, my state um, for, to do, for example, Gibbs sampling. Then I can use a modified version of uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is called Adamax. But, uh, this is very um, a little bit more advanced. Okay, so we can run this thing, for example, just to show you. Um, so typically, you just do make and it's compiled. You just need uh, a few standard uh, libraries. Um, might take a while, though. Okay, so you just run this thing. So it does, so it does these things, and uh, we can also plot in real time what, what's going on. 
So here I'm plotting the function of time of the iteration count, the network that is finding the ground state. Or well, this guy is learning what teasing uh, the guys that the solver this model has learned in a few years. So, uh, so you can see as a function of time, the energy, so the expectation value of the energy. Uh, and uh, you can also see plotted the relative error with respect to exact ground state. So in this case, the, the model is simple enough. I mean, we have uh, 20 spins, we can di diagonalize it, for example, exactly. Uh, and you can see that uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing some progress, right? So already the, the relative er error on the energy is pretty low, and then uh, I can improve it, and I can go as, uh, as low as, uh, I don't know, I think in this case, 10 to the minus four or something. So, um, so this is the same principle that I was discussing before for the, for the, for the transfer field, uh, for, the, for the simple harmonic oscillator, but at work for a, a much uh, more complicated, I mean, a more complicated uh, system where you also, which is basically a many body system where you have interactions and uh, which does not have a simple mean field uh, uh, solution, at least. Uh, but this can be generalized not only to 1D, but also to 2D. You would find very similar results. You have to be a, a bit more careful about the sampling. It's not always uh, that easy. Uh, but, I mean, in general, uh, this is a relatively uh, robust way of finding uh, uh, the ground states. Okay. So, uh, okay, this, I mean, it's, keep, it's going down, but I have to stop at some point. So, let's say to do, yeah. Right. Depends on how patient you are or how many processors you have. Okay, so that's, that was more or less what I wanted to tell you. So I've shown you during this lecture um, how to transform quantum mechanics into, uh, into basically a machine learning problem uh, through this stochastic mapping of quantum mechanics to an optimization problem. Um, and uh, I've also shown you that uh, like a simple choice, uh, one of the, let's say in a sense, most straightforward choices that you can do is to take this RBM machine and identify it with the, with the, with the wave function of, uh, of, your, of your system. So, uh, I mean, after our work, people have started wondering uh, why this, those states work and um, what is the peculiarity or what is the characteristic which makes them suitable to study quantum systems. So I'll discuss some of those issues uh, and uh, ideas in, during my talk. Uh, but I can already tell you that one of the nice uh, features of those states is that because of, the of these new states, if you want, of uh, variational ansatz, uh, is that uh, if you have uh, long range weights, so if, if for example, your uh, effective, if you want, classicalizing model has very long range connections, then uh, the amount of uh, bipartite entanglement, for example, that you can uh, put inside those uh, quantum states uh, uh, typically can, can satisfy volume law very easily. So you don't need exponentially many uh, parameters in, uh, in the wave function to have uh, um, a volume law. So this is nice, for example, if you want to describe uh, uh, critical systems, uh, especially in two dimensions, etc. Uh, where, for example, whereas, for example, with other approaches, uh, you, you might be limited by, by entanglement. Uh, the other thing that people realize is that, is that with those states, you can write uh, uh, basically a lot of interesting topological phases, exactly, uh, like the ground set of interesting topological models, uh, the guitarist models, and other things. Um, uh, and also, this is a nice result, and in some cases, you cannot do that with other states. Um, and uh, uh, one of the, of the results which is also particularly interesting, uh, which uh, uh, is, uh, can have far-reaching consequences, I believe, is that uh, you can demonstrate mathematically that any basically uh, physical quantum state, so any reasonable physical quantum state, can be written as a network with two layers. Okay? So in the classical case, I've shown you that the RBM is enough to describe any classical uh, interaction, any classical energy. So I've told you the, the, the example of the two-body interaction in the classical case, and I told you that you can represent any classical Hamiltonian with that uh, form. Now, in the quantum case, you can demonstrate that if you have three lay uh, two layers, right? So not only the, let's say, these uh, hidden layers we already had in the RBM, 
right? But you also have uh, some extra uh, connections, so like this, for example. So you have two layers now. So physical, sigma one, sigma two. Hidden, H1, H2. And deep, let's say, let's call those deep neurons. Then the, the wave function that results out of, the, out of identifying, let's say, this object with the wave function um, can represent uh, efficiently any quantum state, where efficiently it means that uh, uh, the number of, uh, of uh, neurons that you need is basically uh, a, a polynomial of the number of spins. Right? So in particular, it goes, uh, yeah, it depends on the model. But let's say it's a polynomial, it can be somehow, uh, typically it's n square uh, for, for reasonable models. So this is a very nice result, which I believe will have some consequences in the field, uh, in the sense that uh, if we manage to use efficiently those states, in principle, we can describe any quantum system efficiently. Okay, so I leave you um, to, if you have some questions, I will be very happy to answer now or later. So thank you for your attention.